Together, we're Akari. We're here to talk about our new upcoming brand, El Diablito Jerky. So through El Diablito Jerky, we're taking the hated, reviled, invasive Pez Diablo, or devilfish, in Mexico, and turn it into the most sustainable meat-based jerky. But let me first start with a little bit about this fish. So I came across the devilfish as a Fulbright researcher in 2014 in the southeastern state of Tabasco, Mexico. This fish arrived to Mexico about 15, 20 years ago, and there's a lot of competing theories about how it got there. But the only thing that's really important is that it's there. And since its arrival, it's taken over Mexico. It's now found in at least 13 states, if not more, stretching from southern states like Chiapas all the way to northern states bordering the U.S. Today, the devilfish accounts for between 70 and 80 percent of the wild fish capture. But this isn't just any other fish. This fish can breathe air, like us. It can walk using its fins. This fish can even live for up to 24 hours out of the water. The devilfish reproduces like crazy and eats the eggs of native fish species. Its sharp, bony scales shred nets and slice hands, giving this fish its hated status in Mexico. Now, because of lack of information, as well as, well, let's be honest here, a face that only a mother could love, there's no demand currently for this fish in Mexico. People are afraid to eat it. I even had people tell me that they would rather die of starvation than eat this fish. This is despite the fact that in its native Colombia and, and Brazil, it's, wildly, it's, it's heavily consumed. It's just a normal fish in these countries. Now, because of the lack of demand, because no one wants to eat it, fishermen that capture this fish treat it as useless bycatch. They throw it away. And as a result, tens of thousands of fishermen across Mexico have seen their earnings decline dramatically. And many have stopped fishing altogether. In fact, when we started working in Tabasco a couple years ago, Fishermen that we were working with had been traveling an hour or up to two hours a day to other towns and cities looking for work simply to make ends meet. And now this is where we come in. At Akari, we're creating a market for devilfish products in Mexico as well as the US. Now the concept of our work is really straightforward. We take an invasive fish, we process it, and we sell it. It's a strategy that's been used with other species and other contexts around the world. What makes us unique is our vertical integration as well as our execution. We work directly with rural fishermen to process and package devilfish fillets. We then manage the distribution, marketing, and sale. We sell a portion of this product to corporate kitchens and restaurants around Mexico, but what we're doing now is we're further refining or processing this product into El Diablito jerky. And what's super cool about El Diablito jerky is it tastes and feels like beef or other meat-based jerkies, but it doesn't come with the environmental impact associated with traditional meat farming. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Sam, who's gonna talk a little bit more about where we've been and where we're going. Thanks, Mike. So, as Mike mentioned, we've been working on Akari for the last year and a half now. Well, we were selling fillets to restaurants and corporate kitchens throughout Mexico. We began experimenting with the jerky and our first batch of chili lime was so flavorful that Mike cried. <laughs> After toning down the spice a little bit, we were ecstatic to discover that people loved our product. Since then, we've been importing small quantities to Berkeley, and our sales around campus and throughout the Bay Area have far surpassed expectations with demand outpacing supply at every turn. So, um, so eventually, we began researching the product, and we found that these enthusiastic reactions that we were seeing fit in with wider market trends. People are increasingly looking for high-protein, low-carb snacks with innovative flavors. Jerky is a $3 billion industry and growing every year. Our, yep, um, our costs right now put us right in the middle of this market, of this $3 billion market. Our costs are at $2.74 a bag, which allows us to wholesale for $5 to $6 a bag, which according to our very experienced advisors, which Mike will reference later, puts us right where we need to be for retail sales. So now it's about how do we enter this market. So we are pursuing a class of consumers that we have dubbed the feel-good foodies. 
feel good foodies, they want new and unique products, and they want those products with a positive impact. We are going to attack this market by first leveraging our contacts in large tech companies and in small and medium sized corporations throughout the United States. Through this, we'll be able to grow grassroots demand for our product and allow people to buy our product online through our, on, through our website and other platforms. Eventually, we plan to expand to natural food grocery stores as well as outdoor retailers by pursuing partnerships with distributors such as UNFI. Now, in order to execute this go-to-market strategy, we are growing up. Our packaging has graduated from a sticker slapped on a brown bag to the sharp professional package that you see here. Additionally, we'll have formed an LLC by the end of the month, and we are in conversations with co-packers to mass produce our formula, as well as with shippers to import our raw product from Mexico. Once we have signed those contracts, our costs will drop even lower than the already competitive costs previously quoted. And at that point, it will be time to hit the gas and ramp up sales. Here, we will extend our social media presence so that we can interact with early adopters and use their enthusiasm for our tasty, sustainable product to help, to help spread the word. Our marketing will be like our jerky, lean and mean. Mike? Thanks, Sam. So let's talk a little bit about who we are as a team. Um, Sam and I, as previously mentioned, are second year Master of Development Practice students here at Berkeley. He and I have a range of experience working for different organizations and companies in Asia and Latin America. Axel Cavello, born in Guatemala, raised in Queens. He's a consummate hustler. He's worked on tuna boats, he's worked in IT, and most recently, restaurants in Mexico City. He manages our distribution in Mexico. Victor Hernandez is a third year biology student in Tabasco. He's from a small fishing town close to where we process our fish, and he supervises our production. We're also very fortunate to work closely with three key advisors. The first is Lupita Vidal. She's a celebrity chef in the state of Tabasco. She helps us with everything culinary. Alicia Lumea, my former boss at Cleanfish here in San Francisco. She helps us with marketing and distribution here in the US. And finally, Dave Johnson. Dave used to have a lionfish distributorship in southern Mexico sending filet to the US. He helps guide us through the FDA compliance and regulation process as well as uh, shipping both in Mexico as well as in the US. So to conclude, we're a social enterprise changing the jerky game. Our El Diablito jerky helps restore the natural ecosystem, boost local employment, and has a killer taste that will make you say, quiero mas. That means I want more. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Uh, love this brand, and I think you guys should be on Shark Tank. Um, <laughs> or maybe there should be a Shark Tank for social entrepreneurs. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious what your vision is for uh, other food products, um, and also what the exit strategy is. This is a brand that you want to spin out and sell at one point. Mm -hmm. Sure, like yeah, so in terms of products, over the next you know, two, three years, we're definitely focused on filet and jerky. From there, we've contemplated basing a, a, creating a frozen burger based on Lupita's burger that she sells at a restaurant, which is really good. It actually confuses a lot of people. <laughs> um, so we, we have those kinds of products in mind further down the line. Um, in terms of exit, um, you know, getting acquired further down the line is a possibility, um, but we also kind of have the dream of keep, keep it going and then possibly turning it over to someone like Axel or Victor. You know, social entrepreneurship isn't really a big thing in Mexico, especially southern Mexico. And, Seeing someone like Victor, who you know he started when he was like 18, 19 with us, and now he's like starting to take over the reins with his social entrepreneurship thing. So we kind of like the idea of giving it to someone like him, or you know having him grow up in the organization. So I'll, I'll jump in. One, I, I think the branding is great. I had no clue what I was eating up here, <laughs> um, but after seeing the the packaging, I was so happy to eat it. So thank you, for, yeah. thank you for the great branding. <laughs> Um, can you speak more about the source of, it seems like this is a hard fish to, to actually go out and kind of get, so how are you going to source enough to go national? Yeah, definitely. 
Sure. Um, the, the real advantage of this fish is that it's everywhere right now in Mexico. Um, you know, so we work in Tabasco, which is southeast Mexico. Um, this morning I was talking to someone in Tamaulipas, over by Texas, that wants to sell us between one and 2,000 pounds a week. So he's like, I got all this fish, I, I can't do anything with it. Um, you know, you can go out in the river or the lagoon and it takes maybe an hour to catch 500 pounds of fish um, because it's really this fish and, you know, a few pounds of other fish right now, um, which is the real benefit. It's easy to catch. What, uh, what kind of feedback have you gotten on the taste from, uh, what, what, kind of, what kind of sampling have you done on the taste and what kind of feedback have you gotten? Sure. Yeah. Um, generally, it seems that people, if they like spicy food, they really like our chili lime. Um, if they don't like spicy food, they don't like the chili lime that much. And <laughs> they go for the teriyaki. Um, we're also pursuing, through the Copac relationship, some other flavors, which we plan to test out a little bit more and try to run some, some real kind of, um, I guess, statistically significant type of studies to based off of reorders and um, issues like that. Yeah, and just to chime in really quick is we really tested this product with a, a wide range of clients or people, you know, from friends here at Berkeley to coworkers in the Bay Area and New York, friends like that. Um, my mom even took it to her Mahjong group last week, and they <laughs> loved it. Um, so it's really been tested to a lot of different kinds of people. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, it, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. What, what's, um, so is the, the retail price then close to $10? Around $10 for fish jerky. Um, beef jerky is retail for a little less, 7 8 yeah. Okay. And the bag is what? How many ounces? Two. Two, two ounces. Yeah. That, that's, so you're, you're a bit above Crave? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Got it. And are you, um, what's, what's going to be the first distribution channel? Are you guys selling online? Are you going to try to get into Whole Foods? First distribution channel will be through the corporate pantries. Um, ah, yeah. That's where mm -hmm. our contacts are, and that's really where we think we can expand the grassroots demand for the product. Tastes really good. I actually looked up on jerky.com what salmon teriyaki and other jerky. It's about ten bucks a bag, yeah. just now. Thank you, Google. Um, <laughs> so building a consumer brand is is a tough thing, um, yeah. which but it seems like your go-to-market plan is is at least doable or feasible, and it passes the test of reasonableness. I guess my question is more about as you're thinking about what's the mission behind this is the company, you know, global mm -hmm. social venture. Is there a sort of give back or other angle that you can use to help distinguish yourselves from the 50 other brands of jerky or whatever will show up on all kinds of shelves, retail shelves in other places. Yeah. Um, yeah and can you talk about that? Is there other programs you're going to set up in, in Mexico or something like that? Sure. We, we, yeah, we absolutely have some programs which Mike will speak to in a second. But we think that what really differentiates us on the product side will be our taste and the story behind the jerky. The other, even the other sustainable jerkies, the other fish jerkies, can't compete with us on sustainability. Um, those are tuna, those are salmon. This is a product where, by eating it, you're actually, you could actually make the argument that you're doing something more sustainable than not eating it. So, but then Mike will speak about kind of the give back programs we're going to put in. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, it's a compelling story that we're turning this invasive fish species into jerky and the sustainable, the su sustainable aspect. I think the other thing too is like the story behind the jerky. Um, so I was actually with Las Patronas, it's a group of women that give food to Central American migrants and refugees on the train. Um, and we give a portion of our product to migrant shelters. And I was with them and I was like, you know, I'd love to give you some fish, but you can't give raw fish to people on the train. They, don't, they can't <laughs> cook it. Um, so that's actually the genesis of why we started playing around with like canning it or smoking it. And then we played around with the jerky and then we we're like, this is, killer. It was awesome. And so now we donate a portion to Las Patronas. And so mm -hmm. that's another part of the story. And we're continuing to donate fillets to migrant shelters around as well. Um, I, well, I would, I would agree with everybody here who said that it actually really does taste good and, and the packaging is great. Um, the one thing I notice is that it, it is different in terms of its look a little bit. It, it, smaller, skinnier, not quite, you know, like the Crave has got that thicker mm -hmm. Is that by the nature of the fish you're using, or could it be, you know, a different consistency? Yeah, we're um, we're hoping to kind of lean on the co-packer to see how if they can make it look like that. But also, 
for us, we both remember jerky from when we were kids and when it was, you know, where it was tough and it had some flavor and wasn't just kind of very soft and sweet. So we actually like the, the taste to it right now. And we think that helps with our initial market that we're going after, that feel good foodie that we were talking about. Somebody who might want something a bit more interesting and then we can adapt later. Two quick questions. Um, can you talk more about the uh, nutritional benefits relative to other types of fish, and especially wild-caught fish? Um, anything unique there? I noticed more omega-3s, you said. And mm -hmm. then the second question is you're specifically drilling down into your Amazon strategy. Okay. So, yeah, so, so I'll take the nutrition side. Um, yeah, you're right. It has more omega-3s than salmon, for example. What's nice is that since it's not a predatory fish, like tuna or salmon or marlin, so we're not dealing with a lot of the toxicity issues. Um, we've tested the fish multiple times. It's well, well below. Um, How much lower, like? No, like zero. Like, wow. you know, zero, like the heavy metals and stuff like that. Um, because it shorter lifespan and, you know, all that. Um, in terms of, like, the actual protein comparison and other micronutrients, it's got a lot. I don't know how it stacks up exactly to maybe salmon or tuna, but it's, it's up there. Um, a big benefit it has is because it has a lot of hemoglobin, which actually gives it its firm texture. So it has, like, a lot of iron, and it has a lot of other micronutrients that, mm -hmm. that aren't found in freshwater fish. And for the Amazon strategy, we, we're hoping to stay off Amazon for a little bit because we want to kind of pursue some relationships with other retailers. And we don't want to be put in a position where they can't offer sales on the product because of its price on Amazon. Um, so, we, so before we kind of, the plan right now is before we kind of hit that level of distribution, we would, we would like to establish the brand presence and the relationship in and around the centers that we're looking at. So the Bay Area, Seattle, New York. We launched in 300 retail doors, and I can I have a lot to talk to you about offline on that. Yeah, <laughs> that would be great. We would, <laughs> we would love to hear it. Yeah. Sure. Um, who do you think? Who do you think is a buyer of this? Uh, I know snack foods are are popular. Uh, Hershey's paid like seven or eight times revenue for uh, yeah. Crave. Like a tech multiple. It's pretty exciting. Uh, do you think a company like Hershey's would be a potential acquirer? And, and do any of the big brands own any fish jerky at the moment? Um, so, General Mills um, bought Epic, and they produce some some fish jerky. Um, yeah, salmon jerky. Um, in terms of target buyers, we like target, target yeah, yeah people acquires. that might acquire. Who would yeah. buy? Um, yeah, we've talked about that. Mike, do you remember like some people <laughs> that we talked about? Yeah, I mean, I, I big, think big I th companies with lots of money. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. You know, um, cool, got companies, it. Just to flush yeah. out their portfolio. Yeah, companies, yeah, looking to expand their kind of sustainability portfolio. And also, we see ourselves as a good target for acquisition because mm -hmm. in order to access this supply, you, like, you really need to have these relationships in, in these regions. Like, you can't just kind of come in and do it. Many people have tried and haven't been <laughs> successful. Have you seen any spins data on, uh, on fish mm -hmm. jerky? Any which data? Spins data. <laughs> spins data is like the, do you know what spins data is? Like you should know what spins data is. It, it's it's basically just, uh, you know, how well it's doing in the marketplace, like at Whole Foods and things like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's still definitely a, a smaller niche category as compared to, like, beef or, or right. uh, Well, how big, you said uh, jerky is $3 billion, so how much of that is fish jerky? Uh, a really small portion, probably in the $100 million, a couple hundred million. Okay. Do you have a reason but to believe it's going to grow quickly? Uh, well, because of the healthy protein trend, yeah. um, you know, more sustainable. Sure. Um, but then also we want to go after the beef, turkey, pork, um, instead of trying to fit into that fish category because, you know, it doesn't taste as fishy as like a tuna or a salmon. And mm -hmm. I think we can really go after people that are looking for a healthier, more sustainable option sure. than beef, but can't find it right sure. now. Sure, cool. And yeah, a lot of other fish jerkies are, you know, they're kind of wet and they, they don't feel the same way that ours does. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. Cool.